And without further ado, I am really honored to welcome my friend and uh, amazing poet, Lauren K. Allen, and she is presenting Self and World, Writing the Poems That Matter. Thank you, Lauren, for joining us this morning. Hello, hello. All right, so um, I am really happy to be here. Um, I was just telling Missy I am back from a much needed vacation and this is my first entry totem back into work. It was wonderful to be at this session this morning. I'm looking forward to being community with you all today. And, um, you know, I just feel like there's, I wish there were like never, um, an ideal time for this kind of poem, this kind of moment where we're thinking about um, change, where we're thinking about injustice, or we're thinking about all these um, large, I was in, um, part of my trip was to uh, New Brunfell, Texas, which was an hour away from Udell and the space where um, you know, our most horrific, car, I don't even know if it's the most horrific, right? But um, mass shooting occurred. And what's kind of terrifying is um, our, not just that it happens, but the ways in which um, our responses are, are sort of now normalized, you know, we'll lower the flag, we'll say some words, we'll have feelings. Um, and then we carry on, <laughs> right? Um, as we must, but also what does that carrying on mean and look like? Um, and part of that response I feel really has to do with just a sense of overwhelm, right? Um, how to engage these huge losses, these huge uh, problems, these huge systems of injustice, um, how to enact justice for me anyway, I don't know about y'all. <laughs> Um, feels heavy, it feels large, it feels ungraspable as a single person. And, you know, again, I don't know about y'all, but that usually, that kind of feeling, it's like I just moved a few months ago and the thought of packing all of my belongings simply made me go to bed, right? <laughs> like, I'd cover my head and pretend it wasn't happening. Um, and so what is the, you know, um, for me, I'm grateful for poetry as a space where I can start to, on a really small and intimate and individual level, try to wrap language around those bigger feelings, those bigger issues, um, to feel like here is a step that is authentically mine um, and that isn't going to necessarily change the world, <laughs> right? Because again, um, I think it's in the Poets Companion, um, which is a wonderful book I use with my students for um, poet, um, you know, beginning poets. And they talk about um, the guy who discovered penicillin. And if he'd been said, find a cure for <laughs> that, he probably would have choked. But like, he was just kind of moving around his day and had a, an idea that he followed, right? And I, I hold on to that as like, you know, I don't, you know, I, I need to figure out like what is happening in me, with me, and not in a narcissistic way, but in a way that that clarity opens up the next step, right? That clarity makes the next the next right thing possible, <laughs> as opposed to going to bed, right? We'll pack one box today, <laughs> and eventually the house will become packed, right? Um, and so. I, I spent a lot of time um, developing this workshop that I, I've done in a few places and um, I was telling them earlier, I wanted to see if I could uh, share this file, but I still can't. So where I made a very quickly, uh, uh, let's see if it works, a Google Doc. And so um, I'm working on the assumption that um, everybody can write and that writing, if not, you know, to be published or do, it, it is a way of working with your interiority of, um, of, again, kind of finding the words that you need to articulate your feelings, right? Um, to interrogate your feelings as well, right? I feel like I remember I interviewed Jessica Care Moore once and she said, I can't write a lie. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought like, um, she said, you know, I can say whatever, but like when I sit to write and you know, not like, but to write that, that, that there is a sense of um, 
confrontation of self, uh, of truth telling that can be part of your practice, right? That, that, you know, this is really what I feel. What do I feel about what do I feel? How do I look at what I feel? And um, hold it up maybe to a different kind of light. So I really do think like that's the way that writing, that poetry for me, because it's my genre, can um, produce a space where change is possible, <laughs> right? And that change is my change. And in the engagement of that language in a truthful, um, where am I complicit? <laughs> you know, Where can I act? Where do I have room to move? Where do I have room to grow? Um, what am I refusing to see? What I can, what can't I help but think about, right? Like in, in pulling all of those things into a space, into the linguistic, the language space where I can see them, where I can choose the words, where I can shape them into something meaningful. I think that ideally all of that carries with the poem, right? Um, and so in, in that engagement with the self, <laughs> ideally, again, ideal, um, when you you share or offer that um, with another person that you invite or create an opportunity for the same kind of internal work to happen with your reader, right? And that's how we can make the change. I mean, and again, it's the thing where what's good about that too is it's not the same as writing to your senators and Congress people. It's not the same as protesting in the streets and marching. It's not the same as advocating, right? But it is another action, another tool in the toolbox of which, which we need all of the things, right? We need all of the things, <laughs> right? And so this is not the only thing, but it is a thing, right? And it is, again, I'm like, damn it, why can't I be a doctor and go to the border? Why am I not a lawyer? Well, I'm not. So I got to do what I can do, <laughs> right? And I can write, you know, uh, and again, knowing that and owning that and thinking in this way, how can I, what am I able to do? What strategies can I implore to move, to bend that arc of justice, right? To, to move things forward. So um, in the chat, what I've <laughs> accumulated over the time of uh, working on this and thinking about this, oh, wait, nope. There is a question uh, in the chat, Lauren. I don't know if you want us to have ad edit access. Yeah, I wanted you to have access as a viewer. It says anyone on the internet with this link can view. We can definitely I view. I think we just can't edit, which is fine. That might no, be no, no. Yeah, it's just I just want you to be able to see these. Um, I hopefully you have other spaces for writing stuff. Um, and so uh, this is. <laughs> You know, so it started off with like maybe five or 10 poems, and then I just keep adding poems. So we are not going to try to get through 30 poems today, but I wanted you to have them, right? I wanted you to, to, to have them as a resource. I'm not proprietary at all. So so take them and, and read them and share them and and do do whatever whatever feels great with them. Um, you know, they're all attributed and on all of that stuff. So so there's that. Let me close my Word doc because we may not be on the same page that way. Okay, so again, with this idea, I call the workshop like self and world, right? Like one of the things that I think is that the idea of the self or the individual, um, and we think about that, that as like in here, like everything's inside and interior and, and I and, and here, and then the world is, is out there, right? It's, it's outside, it's separate. Uh, you know, it's, you know, these big topics that, don't, and I was just like, how do we um, cross, how do we bridge those two things, right? Um, how do you think about that breaking that binary of what's outside, <laughs> what's out there and what's kind of in there? And I think thinking about the ideas of relation, right? Like rather than thinking of, of it as separate, like thinking about what are the ways that we can re-envision, re-script our relationship to out there, right? How are we nature? How are we technology? How are we raced? How are we gendered? How are we, you know, so social issues? We are society, right? So so again, just sort of reformatting our, our, our relationship and how we think about our relation and relationship. We're complicit, right? We're engaged. Um, we can take ownership and we have agency. Um, we can 
participate because we do every single day in the structures that promote justice and the ones that promote injustice, right? Um, and putting your head under the blanket about that <laughs> doesn't change the fact that it happens, right? So again, that idea of sitting with um, clarity and constantly being open to and curious about and in engagement with that relationship, I think for me, and hopefully for you uh, through this workshop is um, critical to reclaiming agency, to refreshing perspective and to reminding myself that um, there are ways um, that I, as an individual and as a part of the world, as a part of the society, as a part of the larger thing, um, can engage and can make change. So the first thing I'm going to do, because this is a participatory workshop situation, is um, I'm going to share my screen, inshallah. Yes. And we're going to do a quick um, introductory um, workshop. I, I'm writing exercise. Sorry, I'm all like, what's happening? OK. Um, and so can you can you see that? Yes. OK, yes. Yes. Um, I'm, I keep trying to like make it not take over my entire screen. So we'll look at it this way because it's just one slide big. Um, this is a writing exercise by Natasha Marin, who is a um, poet, performance artist, and she's been doing this for like over a decade. And it's a really simple fill in the blank poem, but I love it <laughs> um, because of just what it's able to make you do. So like this is not an exam. I'll tell my students it's not an exam but it is quick and um, I will give you an example. It's called the Red Lineage, right? Um, and um, if you also go to redlineage.net, there's a, um, you can add your Red Lineage later. But anyway, my name is Poet Red. My mother's name is wrote me a poem when I was born, Red. My father's name is Silent Red. I come from a people of resonance and speaking. Remember me. I just made that shit up, okay? So, <laughs> again, my name is Wandering Red. My f mother's name is Hotfoot Red. My father's name is Go, Go, Go Red. I come from a people known for curiosity and exploration. Remember me. You got 30 seconds. Introduce yourself to us with your red lineage. My name is Hungry Red. My mother's name is You Eaten More Red. My father's name is Better Belly Bust Than Good Food Waste Red. I come from a people known for hunger and hunger and denial. Remember me. Okay, so your 30 seconds are up, but I'll keep talking to give you time. Um, one of the things I love about this, uh, I love many things about this. And one of the things I love about this, that in particular to this context, is the way that it at once asks for distinction and also puts you in community because everybody's read. <laughs> so at the end of all this, we'll be related. We'll be relatives. We're something read but we're something, right, <laughs> right? And so what that thing is, is the thing that distinguishes us and also does not deny commonality and community, self and world in conversation, in the same line, in fact, right next to each other, inflecting each other, right? Shaping each other. And so anybody got a lineage they're ready to share? I'm secretly hoping to hear from everybody. Do you want it in the chat or in 
Oh, or... no, I want to hear your voices if you don't mind. Okay, I can go. Okay, go ahead, Rose. Hi, I'm just walking around. I'm totally with you, but I had my camera off. So oh. my name is Blood Red. My mother's name is Daylight Red. My father's name is Not Too Red. I come from a people known for X oppression. I'm going to write that in the chat. Mm. And uh, passion. Remember me? And I'm writing that in the chat too because I put a question mark behind it. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. Who's up? Yeah. And hi there. Um, I've also been behind my screen, but listening all the time. Um, okay, whatever. I'm just going to go for it. My name is Moving Red. My mother's name is devout red father. My father's name is adoring and protecting. I come from a people known for wisdom and tragedy. Remember me. Thank you. I can I'll read go. mine. Oh, okay. or should I go ahead? Okay, <laughs> uh, this is Jeanette. Um, all right, here I go. Um, my name is written red. My mother's name is hands jaded red. My father's name is stronger red. I come from a people known for siesta and fiesta. Remember me. <laughs> Donna. Yes. Hi. My name is dancing red. My mother's name is responsibility red. My father's name is quiet and hopeful red. I come from a people known for intelligence and persistence. Remember me. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. Oh, goodness. Yeah, who's up? Uh, <clears throat> my name is Beautiful Red, and my mother's name is Soft Red. My father's name is Good Quality Red. I come from a people known for working hard and sweet. Uh, remember me. Lovely. Thank you so much. Hi, Lucy. Is that you? My name is Funny Red. My mother's name is Dancing Red. My father's name is Entrepreneur Red. I come from a people known for impatience and communication. Remember me. Thank you. Anyone? Yeah, okay. uh, my name is Sunlit Red. My mother's name is Caring Red. My father's name is Watching Red. I come from a people known for laughter and quiet. Remember me. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like there's one left, maybe, or are we done? So, countdown countdown i love it thank you all yeah. <laughs> um one of my students and sometimes sometimes i do remember my student my name is not red my mother's name is not red my father's name is not red um, i come from a people known for stubbornness and contrariness remember me <laughs> i don't even remember that kid's real name anymore it's, it's not red forever um but so tell me a little bit about what that was like as a as an experience to to, to write your uh, first poem of the day. Maybe not first poem, ever, first poem of the day. <laughs> Lauren, there's a question in the uh, chat. Beta uh, Ma says, "I'm curious why red instead of other colors." Mm. I like I said, I inherited this framework, but I I you know I have thought about it from for as well. Well, I I haven't thought about it too much because red is my favorite color, so I like loved it. It felt very kin. But again, this was just a framework that uh, Natasha came up with, and so I've always used it. But I I also think there's a provocativeness in the red that feels um like it. I don't know. I feel like it summons out something else. I've thought about doing it with like blue. Um, and I feel more stuck somehow. I don't know, <laughs> but I mean, I, there's no there's no law saying we can't change it. But this is the framework that she's come up with. So yeah, um, I also think there's a sonic element, right? That sort of like um, one syllable 
thing <laughs> that can really um, work poetically a little bit as well. And the repetition works really well. Anne, were you going to say something? Yeah. I just, I feel too like red, obviously the bloodline that we're talking about with, exactly. within all of us, no matter what um, our background is, that is a common thing that all, as humans, we can all say we're, we have that with our lineage. And um, I just found this so powerful, so simple, right? Gosh. It's, it's so exactly that's one of the things I love about it what I also love about it too and it happened even in this group like no sometimes no matter, even with a small group that you you know um, we had multiple people with similar reds right and and so again the idea of connection and distinction really kind of comes up a little bit right um, and so again this idea of of distinguishing oneself and claiming, right? My name is, it's a, it's a declarative sentence. <laughs> um, and it also defines and names other people. What was that like for y'all to have to try to come up with? <laughs> you're shaking your head, Jeanette. <laughs> oh, no, you're on mute. Uh, I thought I hit it. I hit it again. Um, I thought I, that was the one thing It's like, how do I identify myself? Like, this is like, it's so hard, but, and then I, I love, and then I thought back to how you were doing it. You, you put in, you put in like more, almost a sentence in there, I think a couple of times. So, um, so it's like this quick need to want to be creative at the same time, like, you know, put my personality in there. So, um, it, it was, it was, it was just invigorating, you know, to feel like a, like exciting kind of thing. So oh, like great. That made feel. Okay. Rose, think- yeah. You know, it was interesting. It was too, Jeanette, were you done? Uh-huh. Okay. Um, it was super like self-reflective. I was like, do I want my lineage to be remembered? Like, that's why I was like, ah. Mm-hmm. And also I realized <laughs> originally I said, my father's name is not red. And then you were like, this is inclusive. We're all connected. I was like, shit. <laughs> and I was like, oh, what does that even mean? <laughs> like, so, right. Right. But like the depth of of metaphor was really powerful for me. <laughs> and again, what does not red even do? It like insists on an absence, right? Mm-hmm. But like any, again, and this is just like linguistics, it's like I, I literally just wrote a whole section on a paper not too long ago talking about the uns and the nots, which summon the thing and then dismiss it, but you already summoned it. So not red still is red. It's just a red that's gone, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and a gone red is not a never there red and it's not blue, it's not red. <laughs> Right. Um, and so, again, it's just I, I don't know. I really enjoy a lot of what this does. But again, coming back to the idea of naming as a kind of power. Right. And, and, and definition, which I think is one of sort of the fundamental things of poetry, um, the idea of lineage and ancestry of connecting again to something bigger and then connecting even whether it's Zoom squares or people in a room in a conference in an audience like to um, each other. Right. Like, again, that 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 a bond can be as simple as a three letter word right um yeah. i think is just is really cool so anyway that's just a great fun introductory exercise warms us up makes us put ourselves out there sunlit red and funny red and beautiful red i see you <laughs> you've told us who you are at least in this moment right so um lovely to meet you all um all right so Thinking about this idea of um, back to the to the you know just we've warmed up a little bit. I want you to do another writing thing, um, but this is for you. <laughs> so um, okay, maybe not for you. Maybe you may share it later, but not all of it. But I want you to write it right now for you, and you can pick what from it you want to share. And it's our bib list. Um, again, so this is self and world, and we're thinking about arts, we're thinking about change, we're thinking about justice, all these big things. So this is your bib list. It's your big issue botheration list, <laughs> right? So what matters to you? What are the things that are full focus and clear and sent, like, you know, these are things that, and again, we're on the big issues, right? Just, just the big things, like, go for it. Um, and then I want you to think, you know, so again, you could probably got a list right there. Um, and then I want you to think about 
what's maybe in the periphery as well like what are things that like i can't think about but so so again just just the big issue stuff like i'm a, i'm like i can't think about climate change some days so i'm like it's too much like we're all gonna die and i can't right but i'm like black lives matter i can do that today i can do that every day right so there's make your list go for it put all the things we got a minute. And what did you say the G stands for? Oh, it's just, it's BIB, B I B, your big issue oh, moderation yeah. list. I was like, big. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm silly. I like little acronyms. They oh, big, so big list. So, like, no, hold on. It was, I should call it the big list. Hold on. It's a B I B. Okay. Big list. <laughs> big would make more sense, but I'll have to figure out what G would stand for. Um, how many shall we list? Oh, you're 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 just going for it. All the things. Put all the things. All the things. Put the big things. Put the small things. Put the international things. Put the local community things. Put the family things. Put all the things. How's your list going, y'all? Oh, I can't stop. <laughs> no, no, right? That's that's part of that's part of what I want us to realize. If we stop to just really think about all the things we're consciously, subconsciously, unconsciously worrying about, it's a lot. And again, right, that that overwhelm can can <laughs> it's just like ah. Whatever did happen to all those children who were at the border? Like, where are they? What's going on with that? Um, you know, I went to restrooms in uh, Destin, Florida, and almost and every almost every rest stop has like these signs. Um, if you're being trafficked, if you're being held against your will, <laughs> if you uh being you know call this number scan this barcode and i was just like holy shit like this is where we live we live in a society where like it's entirely possible that the like 
mother child that walk into a restroom aren't actually in fact mother and child um right uh, my sister is pregnant uh, she is a black woman in america who is pregnant black maternity health week was a couple of weeks ago and i learned that if black maternity was a job it would be the fifth most dangerous job in america um terrifying <laughs> uh right I, it could go it goes on and on and on and on and on right it's okay i'm like of course gun violence of course ukraine so many homeless i live in a city that doesn't have you know i live in not a city first of all so going to the city and seeing so many homeless people is so jarring i was just like right okay and i think tennessee just outlawed being homeless like i don't even know what you do with that but right are we here with roe v wade oh yeah. there's so much <laughs> there is so much um so what I want you to do is think about or look at your list and maybe just pick one or two things you might want to think about more today because it can get ex just one or two things that that feel urgent and pressing and necessary today. Mm. Right? We're unpacking the kitchen or packing rather the kitchen or maybe it's not even the whole kitchen but just the silverware drawer <laughs> right um what is the thing that you you think and then what i want you to do is um take those one or two things and put some language just just words phrases your own others anything sort of around that 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 just feels like it might give you some some traction any language anything feelings thoughts snippets slogans whatever pull from wherever uh, and just kind of write write some words down around that Missy, what time are we supposed to be done? <laughs> oh, Jeanette, Jeanette. Oh, hi. I'm um, sorry. Uh, we are supposed to be done at 1210. It is... Okay. Uh, and it's 1130. 1130. So. And I'm going to ask you to take a couple seconds to kind of wrap up and maybe we'll do some just listening and solidarity and fellowship of sharing <laughs> some of our big issue, the one, not the, not the whole, you can pick either you want to do your list or your thing you want to focus on. Um, just, I think um, that there is a little bit of power in sort of, again, that naming, right? Saying the thing out loud, saying it in a safe uh, and shared space um, in community. 
Um, I'm happy to open, um, like I said, my sister is pregnant, um, which has been, I have, I have no kids. Um, that's just not, as my friend says, not my ministry. <laughs> And so um, I'm her big sister. I've big sistered everything for her, but I'm like, I cannot big sister this. I do not know. And what I know and what I read is terrifying to me. So um, I think of, I forget which law persons and, you know, our numbers are fine if we don't count black women in the black mortality, um, in, sorry, uh, maternal mortality rates. Right. If we don't count black women, it's all fine. Whew. Um, like I said, the fifth most dangerous job in America, according to Twitter, is trying to, you know, give birth as a black woman. I think of Beyonce and Serena, who both had, you know, even as ultra wealthy and, you know, agented as they appear um, that weren't listened to, weren't heard, you know, um, and were endangered. And that word came up for me. I was thinking it's, you're so vulnerable. And then I thought, no, the word is endangered, right? Like this is an endangering positioning as you know, um, what does it mean to, to produce more black bodies into an anti-black state, into an anti-black world? Um, how do you, how do you protect that new black body? Um, how do you protect the black body that is producing the new black body that is also itself in, in right? It's just ah, it's so much. Um, it's so much and it feels um, unknown. That's the word that's really in kind of caps for me. It's like, it's also like unknown and unknowable um, and a little bit scary. So that's where I'm at. That's where my head's at today. Um, I invite you to share. I can go. Mine's short. I have this long list of big issues. And then I just chose uh, refusal to learn. Mm. In just a few words, I wrote, um, are you not curious? How do you not know what you do not know? Are you intrigued? Can you see inside your own thoughts? We are not done. And do you wonder if the world could be kinder? Ooh. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Questions, y'all. Best answers are in questions. <laughs> Anyone else feel like sharing? I can share a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> the big issue for me, doctoral graduation, um, good health, good emotion balance, academic developments, enjoy lives, contribute to the society with my thoughts um, and the creativity, and extend my interests and hobbies, have a beautiful house in an environment-friendly place in the future, um, take care of my family members, and lifestyle choice. Um, that's all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, Lauren, when you said to write all the, uh, like, little bit of list, I don't know, for some reason, mine felt bigger than the, li like, little things that had to get done. I mean, I, I, and I think about all those things that you talked about, you know, like the abortion rights, you know, and, and, uh, you know, all these things that make me mad in the world, and I want to change. And sometimes I feel like they're so big. So my, but my list was kind of big. So I started out with, you know, doing little things for my family and friends so that they know that I care about them. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, remembering to be kind to others, like just those little moments, you know, you don't have to tell anybody. Um, and then, uh, and then I wrote the thing that I'm remember, have to, to remember to do in the next few days is send my father and my, uh, a, a gift for Father's Day and my niece a gift for her graduation. And then I started thinking about San Antonio and home because that's where they live in, te in Texas. And then automatically, I think this is the place where my heart is. So I said, you know, I often count the days while when I'll be there again, my heart has always and will always live there. And of course, I think I often have to show that it's not that Texas isn't, isn't just a place where, you know, these other issues happen, you know, people get mad and, you know, talk about how bad and they need to leave the, the country. And I said, but some when I go, it's where I find my strength, you know? So it's this, 
balance for me. So that's where I started writing. Thank you. I can go next. Okay. Um, so on my mind now is I do a lot of community engaged work. And right now I have a fellowship with a professor at school um, at the U of R where basically like she's writing an ethno like a book like such ethnography and like my cohort of student researchers are helping her to generate like data but we're also helping and like working with a not-for-profit called flower city noir collective it's these it's supposed to generate like a place places of joy and learning and nourishment for um young black queer youth femmes um but it's also open to everyone but the founders chris and noel are um queer black femmes and they've experienced like being kept out of spaces for black um mm -hmm. young black people just because they don't they haven't some at times fit the mold of the queerness it's it's mm -hmm. about like, being ostracized or kind of, and she they want to create spaces where you know people who have not been accepted or been rejected from programs can go and like have career development learn to do gardening um etc and increasing like youth literacy like all of these amazing things and it's really hard because for me i feel i've become so personally invested in the success of the program but at the same time there i've existing in the spaces with them and seeing what they're up against can be so depressing at times like recently we met with a, a developer, a, a well-meaning white woman. And she was kind of, she was using racial microaggressions, like playing on stereotypes. And, you know, she, at the same time, like it kind of like white saviorist, but she thinks like she's woke. And it's just, it's confusing. It's frustrating. It's like heartbreaking, but it's like, what do you do? You have to have hope. But at the same time, it's so depressing that in our society, it's like regular old people have to take it upon themselves to fix and try to address these systemic issues that should never be the burden of individuals. And it's just like, what do you do with that? So that's what's in my mind. Thank you so much for sharing that. Anybody else feeling moved? I can share. Um, I chose out of my list depression. Mm. Um, and it's a, it, you know, my daughter suffers with depression. So I, I was just coming up with basically single words. Mm -hmm. um, blame, persistent, isolating, dark, alone, terrifying, stillness, stuck, tears. And then I thought, I, ha I, ha I can't just stay there. So then wrapping, reassuring, loving, never enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, I, oh, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. And, okay. no. I, I don't have, I can keep. No, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Um, I, I would just, my mind went the long list. I, I, I think I saw it more as a, a question to myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, so I, I have a, a the center word is hospitality mm -hmm. and shooting off from it. These are the things that I guess were coming up to me, um, creating safe space for myself and others, providing nourishment, food, mind, heart, creating place of welcome, honoring others' ways, celebrating big and little joys, speaking out through my art and my words. I think hospitality to me is um, a real challenge, mm -hmm. you know, in a sense, because it's what I, 
what I really want the most, you know, but it's, it's to be really hospitable, I think is just, uh, it's a good question that I need to ask myself. Am I really being hospitable in every way and, and how to do that? Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing y'all. And I feel like hopefully already putting the language to the feelings and the thoughts you can already maybe feel yeah. <laughs> something shifting. Yeah. Um, and again, I, I don't know, I wouldn't say it only works if you're a writer, but, <laughs> but I think as a writer, that's one way I know for sure I can shift a feeling, right, is, is through words. And, and I offer it as a methodology to others who might find other ways. Um, you know, I know you're a dancer, Missy and Donna, right? But, but maybe this other way <laughs> is, is, is also a, another door, right? Another tool. And so then as a poet, I think, well, all right. So what we have um, in the, the link, are you, you're able to see, right? You're, you know, let's look at some poems and just, um, I hope, find and they're, they're kind of organized, but not really, because like I said, I, I just keep, keep adding to this bracket. Um, but thinking about what are, hold on, where did my sheet go? Here we go. Um, for me, the poem serves as an entry point, right? Language is an entry point, just any old language, free writing, listing, just some non-structured ways of, of, of unlocking. Um, but then again, I'm a writer, so I think of, okay, how do I make the poem then, um, which is a more um, constructed and structured, <laughs> right, point of entry, a, a created thing, right, that, that I then take the feelings, I take the words and then I make something, right, that somehow speaks into that is a, a different kind of key, right, um, to, to engaging. And so um, there's so many ways that I see other poets, right, doing that work. And um, so just to give you some of the of, of my list here, um, and we'll look at some examples of some of these, um, the poem as letter, the letter format, who would you write to? And what would you want to say? And here we have Matthew Alsman's, we'll read that one, um, uh, you know, letter to those who, um, who in 50 years or something, um, I'm terrible, the titles are in there. Um, persona, which is to say you're not writing the I that is you, the individual, the self that you know, but if you, is there another voice that might have something to say um, and that could engage your issue better? Maybe it's not me, the person who has no kids and never had any <laughs> that writes this poem, um, right? Maybe there's another voice, of course, with that, I want to pay real quick. You want to be careful and consider ethical issues and appropriation issues of, of another voice. But at the same time, it also offers empathy and a shift in perspective and a decentering of the I voice, right? So again, um, there was a huge poetry controversy a few years ago of like, uh, Carson Wee, Anders, um, Anders Wee, writing in the voice of a homeless in African-American vernacular when clearly that was not their wheelhouse. Um, so again, you wanna be careful and mindful and thoughtful and not unintentionally commit more harm in your attempt to, but, but also I think it is a legitimate uh, poetic device is persona, is another voice, the voice that is perhaps more suited to, to speak on this issue, right? Um, there's simple testimony and story, right? The narrative poem, the poem that tells your own story or another story that someone shared with you, right? Kind of goes along persona, like you are the teller, you are the speaker. Um, the trace poem, it's a handy exercise. I love it. Um, so by what I mean is a trace poem is if you find a poem that is doing something right, what are the moves that that poem is making and to make them yourself? Because you won't wind up in the same place because the poem is about language. And if you're not using the same words, you're not gonna end up in the same place. But if you see the moves in a poem that feel like they're carrying you where you want to go with your own work. And I, I simply say with those, be sure to 
make a nod to your <laughs> to your, the original poem after in conversation with for that poet in your in as a um epigraph um but certainly absolutely again i do this with my students all the time let's walk through this poem let's see what does this poem do and how do we do that like again follow literally in the footsteps and see what that feels like and how it helps you to open um declare yourself the poems that uh, that say or confront, you know, where are you in this issue? Um, considering it dimensionally, considering being complicit or agented, what's your part, what's your role, who are you, I, in this big issue? Um, I am like sister auntie, <laughs> right? Like, that's me and that's where I'm coming from. What might that perspective offer that, again, maybe not be something that's in the conversation usually, right? Um, also name the loss, name the loss, right? Um, sometimes that's really hard to do. We think we're angry about something, like we're angry about Texas, but what we're really angry about is the sense that, at least for me, that nowhere is safe, right? Yes, absolutely. I'm grieving and outraged about those children's lives, but I'm grieving a sense of safety for my own <laughs> as well, right? And that's okay, right? Naming and being really specific and maybe even unpopular in what is the real, real seed? What's the real kernel at the, at the heart of what are you grieving or outraged or confused about? The question poem. Um, uh, I think, was it uh, Anne, or I forget who had those questions. Um, the question poem, sometimes we want to declare, but sometimes it's not a declarative moment. Sometimes it's an interrogative moment, right? We ask, what are the questions? Um, one of the poems in the packet is my 10 years after 9-11, 9-11 poem. Um, I had just left New York. I left, I left New York in August. I left my sister in New York in August and she was finishing. We went to the same university um, college in, in, in New York. Um, I left in August of 2001 and 9-11 happened a month later. Um, and I wrote a lot of very bad poems because I was trying to have things to say. <laughs> <laughs> and the poem that won up being the most successful and that only survived, hopefully nobody ever sees those other ones, is the one that was just all questions. All right. Um, sometimes it's the questions. Um, and then the dream poem, right? This is the the way that we can can lift ourselves out of of the the morass that Lucy said, that heaviness, that the the oppression and, and frustration and outrage and just, oh, it's just so much. Um, what would you fix if you could? How would you build or imagine? Um, Martin Espada's Imagine the Angels of Bread closes this packet where he's like, you know, um, freedom first came with the imagination of hands without shackles, right? What do we imagine? How do we imagine the future we can work towards? How do we make it less unknown because it's known in our minds, right? And in our imaginative, imaginative spaces. Um, and then um, just being inspired, right? Like, oh, the other place, the other poem, I I think it's in, another, I have so many versions of this, but um, Dines Smith's Summer Somewhere, if you've not read that poem, it's amazing. Um, I might have to find it for y'all and stick it in the Google Doc. Um, but another poem that imagines um, a black boy's heaven, right? That word safe and loved and oh it's just it's a gorgeous 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 um set of poems um and then the inspiration poem again you don't have to start from scratch you don't have to invent the wheel we can be in conversation right with in conversation with um so again i'm I had hoped we would write but i feel like with 20 minutes maybe we just read <laughs> some poems and you have these and you have some language and you have something and hopefully you'll have um, what I like to call some mentor poems to uh, to think through as well. And, and I'd like to start with the first poem in in the collection uh, uh, in this, you know, this this 
selection of poems by Carolyn Forche, um, which I think is just one of the most beautiful and generous um, kind of ways of bearing witness without claiming the story. Right. Um, I, I know Carolyn pretty well. And this is this is a, it's almost a transcript of a poetic transcript. Let's call it that of an encounter that she had with a taxi driver um, who was a refugee. I'll drink some water here. I can't read a Carolyn Forche poem in a crackly, froggy voice. The Boltman. We were 31 souls all, he said on the gray sick of sea in a cold rubber boat, rising and falling in our filth. By morning, this, this, this didn't matter and no land was in sight. All were soaked to the bone, living and dead. We could still float, we said, from war to war. What lay behind us but ruins of stole piles, piled on ruins of stone? city called mother of the poor surrounded by fields of cotton and millet city of jewelers and cloak makers with the oldest church in christendom and the sword of allah if anyone remains there now he assures they would be utterly alone there's a hotel named for it in Rome, 200 meters from the Piazza di Spagna, where you can have breakfast under the portraits of film stars. There the staff cannot do enough for you. But I'm talking nonsense again, as I have since that night we fetched a child, not ours, from the sea, drifting face down in a life vest, its eyes taken by fish or the birds above us. After that, Aleppo went up in smoke, and Raqqa came under a rain of leaflets warning everyone to go, leave, yes, but go where? We lived through the Americans and Russians, through Americans again, many nights of death from the clouds, mornings surprised to be waking up from the sleep of death, still unburied and alive, but with no safe place. Leave, yes. We obey the leaflets, but go where? To the sea to be eaten, to the shores of Europe to be caged, to camp misery and camp remain here. I ask you then, where? You tell me you are a poet. If so, our destination is the same. I find myself now the boatman driving a taxi at the end of the world. I will see that you arrive safely, my friend. I will get you there. What? <laughs> and so this moment of amplification of someone else's story without claiming it. There are no handprints of Forche on this poem, except in that last line, which simply says, this is how I come to be the voice telling you this poem, right? So thinking about how, how might you simply be a, a vessel, <laughs> right? Um, to sort of pull on the metaphor of, of, of the boatman, where she becomes the boatman of this boatman's story, right? And again, the thing is she's at this residency, I think in like Minnesota, um, and the same taxi winds up coming a couple of days in a row and they wind up talking and, and he's telling this story. And, and of course, she's not a repository of this story, that this guy in a taxi is not going to have the Pulitzer Prize winning <laughs> sort of right um, platform to say. It. So again, that we can sometimes simply be the vessel for um, some sort of testimony. Um, I'm going to just kind of go through, but if you feel moved to make a comment, by all means, um, carry on, <laughs> do so. Um, I feel like so many people are familiar with Warshan Shire's home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. Um, it's, it was very much again, out of the refugee crisis. She's, a I want to say Kenyan, British Kenyan poet and um, 
and writes this wonderful piece. It's been used in Parliament. It's been multiply produced. Um, and if you've not kind of read the whole poem, it's on here. Um, again, it's kind of hard for me to choose because I want to read like all 30 pages of poems. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Not going to do that. Um, but I do think that, um, again, here, this is a testimony that is very much self, right? She's telling us um, what her story is. Okay, maybe we'll read that one because it's just so good. Um, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. The boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you. Fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought of doing until the blade burnt threats into your neck. And even then you carried the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in an air in airport toilets, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear you wouldn't be coming back. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains, beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the stomach of a truck, feeding on newspaper, unless the miles traveled means something more than journey. No one crawls under fences. No one wants to be beaten, pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire and one prison guard in the night is better than a truckload of men who look like your father. No one could take it. No one could stomach it. No one skin would be tough enough. The go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers sucking our country dry, niggers with their hands out. They smell strange, savage, messed up their country. Now they want to mess ours up. How do the words, the dirty looks roll off your backs? Because maybe the blow is softer than a limb torn off. Or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble than bone than your child's body in pieces i want to go home but home is the mouth of a shark home is the barrel of the gun and no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore unless home told you to quicken your legs leave your clothes behind crawl through the desert wade through the oceans drown save be hungry, beg, forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. So Sheree, right, comes back not herself this level of refugee but really putting herself and making that eye voice right that not that that speaking again as in like I, again her poetic handprint is all over this story right but as a as a different kind of testimony right not the sort of relayed version that we get from the boatman but one that's way more inhabited that really steps into what must this be like and, and again, kind of to go to Donna's question earlier too, like the curiosity, what must it be like to be, right? Like what makes somebody leave home and not making the assumption that you have the answer to that, but to really spend the time in the poem interrogating that question, um, I think is really... Uh... There's some comments. Yeah, um, Ooh, Lauren and sorry, Lauren. thank you for I can't keep an eye on all the um, things. So. Well, Mena, I think she replied to the last, the first poem that you read was very, mm -hmm. so beautiful. And Rose just, um, she said, I got booted out of the end. The, the first line of that is of the, is mind blowing in all caps, mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lauren, that first line is just like, oh, right. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, oh. Was somebody going to say, yeah, Mina, Mina. Oh, is that how you say it? Yeah, Mina? I, I just want to say I really enjoyed it, your poems. You, when you read it, I 
can feel the ring of this poem and uh, the, the beautiful sound and uh, the repeat words, repeat mm -hmm. the topic. And uh, also I like the way narratives, way naturally uh, narrative the story and uh, mm, it's beautiful, yeah. And I think that's one of the things that, again, as a poet, that you you can do too, right? Like, um, to 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 trans sort of transform into a way that uh, that does work in the body, <laughs> right? Um, that you hear and that you can picture and you can envision through the use of imagery that you feel the resonance through the repetition, right? So again, that idea of of using the the poetic to um, massage the interior, right? To move the interior, right? Through the ways that poetry can do, and not just with um, the aim of beauty, but with the aim of of change and transformation, um, right? That that the aesthetics don't have to be their own end, but they become a tool in in movement and in change. Oh gosh, I'm looking at the time um, and there's so many more poems. Um, I wanna look at a couple more though that use some maybe a couple of different, um, let's go to on, on it's page uh, 22 of 29 on the Google doc, just to think of again, some more like eye centered ones. I love just to put it out there. Um, the Silver Spoon Ode by Sharon Olds, which is on the, the page above. Um, and I put that in here because I, I just don't know if I know a more complicit poem. Sharon Olds says, she like calls herself, you know what, we're going to read it, Silver Spoon Ode. Um, so it says on the page before 28, I think. Um, I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth and a silver knife and a silver fork. I would complain about it. The spoon was not greasy. It tasted like braces, my shining access to cosmetic enhancement. And I complained about the taste of my fillings in my very expensive mouth, as if only my family was paying. Where did I think the rich got their money but from everyone else? My mother beat me in 4-4 four -four time, and I often now rant to her beat. I wear her rings if, as if I killed her for them, as my people killed and climbed up over the dead. And I sound as if I'm bragging about it. I was born with a spoon instead of a tongue in my mouth, dung spoon, diamond spoon. And who would I be to ask for forgiveness? I would be a white girl. And I hear Miss Lucille as if on the mountain where I'd stand beside her and brush away the insects and sometimes pick one off her, sometimes by the wings and toss it away. And Lucille is saying to me, you have asked for enough and been given in excess. And that thing in your mouth, open your mouth and let that thing go. Let it fly back into the mine where it was brought up from the underworld at the price of lives, beloved lives. And now enough, Shar. Now a little decent silence. Donna, your face is my face every time I read this poem. Now, the Lucille here is Lucille Clifton, who is an African-American poet. They were close friends, and they actually taught together at um, a retreat in California. And so this, I can sort of see the backdrop for this poem happening, right? But, like, way to call yourself out, yeah. <laughs> right? Way to be like, it is not that I don't have problems, but I have some, I, the level of my problems do not rise to the level of everybody else's problems. And sometimes I need to be reminded of that. <laughs> of course, I love the irony of a little decent silence. It results in a poem. <laughs> but um, what I love in this poem is the way that it both holds her experience. I was abused. I was shackled in these ways. And it puts that into context of a bigger thing what shackled me was paid for with lives beloved lives of others and i see and know that too and i can hold that knowledge as well and in fact in holding that knowledge it reconfigures 
what I see as my place, as my obligation, as what I'm owed, as my entitlement. I want to whine about my life. Yeah. Okay, I did that and now enough. <laughs> right? Um, so following that, the again, I'm going really quickly because I know we're getting to be out of time. I want to um, take us to... Uh, so many places but <laughs> I can... we have about three minutes go ahead yes go. we have three minutes but it goes directly into the um the collective discussion and christine isn't here so we, it does give us a little more time but i would also like to respectfully request that you read one of your own lauren because oh. <laughs> because lauren's are also like uh hugely impactful so please <laughs> thank you so much um okay oh. Well, okay. Well, I think I can, I think I can, um, I think I can scoop up two things um, with one here because I wanted to, I was thinking of closing with Martine's poem, which I was trying to hurriedly reformat um, in the beginnings of the poem. It got, when I transferred it to the Google Doc, it got all out of whack, but I think I can get a few in, where did I put it? with um, one of my Gretel poems. So I've been writing a lot of poems um, in the voice of Gretel from Hansel and Gretel for many, many years. <laughs> I've done um, uh, uh, some work with a collaborator. My best friend and I discovered our love of fairy tales in grad school. Um, and we were particularly, we said, you know, Disney can't ruin Hansel and Gretel because there's no wedding, right? There's no love story here. So, um, it still kind of remains. What do we think of this girl who commits murder, by the way, saves her brother, um, and there's there's so much. And and again, the original tale. You know, I think about safety. Right, it's one of the things I think about a lot as a woman in the world, and how um, in that particular fairy tale, none of the adults are safe. Right, the parents throw you out in the witch and then I think well is it really how it goes because you know we love these women who are evil um and in the end of the original tale they take the witch's treasure and go back and the father is there the stepmother is magically gone um and he sees them and of course the riches which and then they all live happily ever after and I'm like what the hell? right and but then I also think what does it mean if uh, our perspectives are more seriously and more often taken um, from young girls. And I don't know, because I don't have my self view on, but um, I just had this chat book come out called Unbecoming Gretel that like thinks about the fairy tale. So I do things with like rewriting the actual fairy tale, but also now Gretel is just like a perspective. I'm like, what is this badass, traumatized girl have to say about the world because that's really what fairy tales are supposed to do right they're supposed to give us a way to think about the world um and so i keep thinking about that so this is one persona right what voice might have a different perspective than yours but this is also a dream poem right like um how might we inspire ourselves to do something differently and I think it's on page 14 of the, um, so one, of, and this is also a pandemic poem. So I, I'm, I'm trying to get all the birds, I don't like killing them, but <laughs> get all, hit as many notes as I can with this last poem, which is Gretel's note on normal. And Gretel is speaking. You want, I know, to go back to normal, that distant sepia sweet place your memory has touched up with erasure and longing I know. I can tell you how in the hell of the cottage that kidnapping come quarantine, all I could think of was home. I drew the blanket of the familiar over my days and dreams, wept when the new reality of my life poked me with its bony finger, ordered me to rise and cook, all of it a cage I could not break. When at last I bested the witch and found her treasures, my future gleaming possible in my hands, I chose to run back to what I remembered. I write you now from that place, which is to say, I would go to that girl heaving with relief and remind her that she was no lost sheep, but a lamb sent to the slaughter. 
I would tell her that the sacrificed are not meant to survive the cut, that return is another word for re-wounding. I would tell her she has been sharpening the formidable weapon of her mind, that her hands could build as well as burn. Forget normal and back and happily ever after. I would say to her, imagine otherwise. Gretel to the world. <laughs> Um, so I, yeah, I, you know, again, I always, I always do this. There's always too much, <laughs> but, um, hopefully you have a lot of material here. We've brought to the fore and to the front of mind, some things that we want to think about, that we want to work on, that we want to change and, um, have some tools and some mentor poems, some inspiration poems, um, some techniques and poetic strategies that can help us enact that desire in language for what it's worth, for who it can help, and for what it might mean. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to do this. I hope this was helpful. Uh, thank you so, so much, so much. Well, we can open for questions and things like that. I do have a question that is probably a really annoying question, but oh, I'm gonna ask it anyway. <laughs> I'm just wondering, like, do you spend tons of time on one poem? Do you like churn them out and then not worry? Like how, like, or is it different every time? Like how, how much time do you spend on one piece? Um, I think that depends on the poem. It really does. Um, I wrote this Gretel poem in one sitting. It just, I mean, I, I changed could build to can build, but it's pretty. <laughs> It just, and I, I have some poems that, but you know, I, I write like that in general. I remember um, when I was a TA, my first, um, when I left New York for Iowa, I was uh, to do my MA and I was behind a desk for the first time. And it was really, um, I, there was a terrible textbook we had to use, but it had one useful chapter and it described kinds of writers and um, the heavy planner, right? The people who outline and and all of this stuff and the, uh, and the heavy, uh, and not outline, sorry, and the heavy reviser. So the folks who like put all the things in and then fix and fix and fix and fix and the heavy planners like do a lot of it here and then, and that's how I write in general. I say that and then in my first book, there's a poem that took me 10 years, like literally. Yeah. <laughs> to write um, from beginning to end, but it was a hard, 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 hard poem to write. And so I do think that it depends on, it depends on the piece and um, where I am in this, in, in the clarity part, right? Like, like, you know, if I don't know what the heck I'm really trying to do, it takes much longer. And I always give poems time anyway, right? Like I, I believe in the, you write it, you put it away. And then you come back to it and then um, you know a little bit more what you're doing, right? Because I feel like that first draft pushes you into the space of clarity that you can then be in for a while and then you can go back to the poems with, with more clarity. So it's a it's a constant traversing, right, of, of um, yeah. Amena had raised her hand. She also had a question earlier that I think we missed, uh, but I'll let Mena. Mena, did you want to go ahead? Yeah, my question is, uh, does the content serve the form, serve the form or the vice versa, the form serve the content? Yeah, um, well, that's a Richard Hugo question, right? He says, does truth conform to music or does music conform to truth? And that's a decision that every writer has to make, <laughs> right? Um, I am a Gemini, so I believe in having my cake and eating it. And I think that, yes, I know birthday this week. <laughs> Um, but I think that I think that the right form enhances content. And I think that it can challenge content. I think content can break form. Like, I mean, that poem I said that took 10 years to write, like it wound up being a 10 sonnet sequence in my first book, right? Like <laughs> um, where I'd been trying to write this, this, this really heavy poem and I kept trying to write it in the, you know, what poems look like. And it was like too much, it was too much. And between like uh, an interesting encounter with caffeine and reading a lot of books and discovering the crown of sonnets as a form, suddenly 
both exploded the one poem, but also gave it room to breathe um, and to evolve, right? And so I do think that thinking about form, form is a tool. It's another tool in the toolbox, right? Um, it, again, that poem was about like my own sexual assault and to have the sonnet structure to write inside of that was really helpful because given all the words and language in the world, again, curl up and don't want to, <laughs> right? Um, and so again, form can, can do, it's like a corset, right? Can pull you in and give it a shape. Um, on the other hand, I do think that sometimes form can, uh, you know, I tell this to my students all the time, like, you know, write a villanelle, and be like, oh, I write a villanelle. And then the, the content that the form solicits or pulls from you is unexpected, <laughs> right? That it can itself call um, to a certain kind of content. So I think they, I think they, again, kind of dance with each other a lot. Questions, questions? Oh, I, well, um, I, I guess I had a question. I, I don't know, you kind of touched on it, but like the how do you know when something's done? Like you, you know, like, I mean, do you have, I mean, you had this, you said you had this long poem that took you 10 years to write. How do you, how did you know it was done? You know, like with, or how do you, or do you write something and then you want to come back to it? Or do you have, I mean, do you have poems like that? Um, yes, I have, I have, I have many abandoned drafts. I think the thing that, um, there, there's so many answers in my head. Hold on. I have to do it sometimes like a traffic jam in there. Um, so one, I would say, sometimes a poem is done when you're done with the poem, right? <laughs> right? Um, um, I'm good, it, it's fine, right? I think sometimes a poem is done when a poem is done with you, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, and you're like, I think this is gonna, you're like, no, it's not. Like, there's more, there's more, there's more. I feel like sometimes that's the poem being like, you cannot crap out of me now. Like, we're doing this, right? Um, I think, I think sometimes a poem can't be done until you're the person that can finish the poem, which is the thing I think that happened with the tenure poem. I wasn't ready to confront the things that, I would have had to confront in order to write a successful poem. I think that happened with the 9-11 poem. And sometimes we just have to grow to meet our poems. <laughs> and um, and I get, that happens in the inverse. Sometimes you get disappointed when like, I mean, I love Tony Hoagland as a poet. I love his poetry. And he was so disappointing as a human. I was just like, oh, you never caught up with your poems. You know? <laughs> Right. That happens with all our arts. Right. Like, like, oh, this is a brilliant. Oh, but you're a jerk. Like, right. Like sometimes people don't they never catch up. And um, I always want to be writing a smarter poem than I am, because then I got the goal right in front of me. Like, oh, I want to be this person. Right. I want to I want to be this empathic and generous. I want to be this thoughtful and not just, like, Fuck you. you know, like I'm that person, too. <laughs> about i'm thinking of the large issues situation right um when is the poem finished yeah i think those are about some of the ways and i i think time finishes the poem too right like sometimes writing i'm like i don't even know and i go away and then like you know months years however long later i come back and it's really clear to me like oh, these lines don't belong. And then I was like, oh, that was it, but I couldn't see it in that moment, right? So time is a, a definitely a finisher for me as well. Thank you, thank you, yeah. Lauren. Yeah. Lauren, I, I just wanna say, I, I am just so thrilled to have been part of your morning and, and, and you just all the thoughts you've brought into my head, but I my mother-in-law was a, a, a poet and, um, and did a treatment on Hansel and Gretel as well. And oh, really? when I started hearing you at first, I thought, oh my gosh, she would love to have met Lauren. <laughs> we would have had great conversations together. And and I really just appreciate um, just just everything you've been saying. And I, and I think there is quite a parallel between um, poetry and dance actually in the making of it. I feel like poetry is um, struggles with the same you know, grapples with the same issues that we're trying to do when you're choreographing um, 
And, and often people think of dance and, and maybe a blank canvas, but I see it much more with the poem, you know, the way the poem, because it's imagistic and it's, it can be narrative, but it's not always. And anyhow, just really, really appreciated all your gems that you offered. And um, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I just realized, I don't know the time, it's like 1222. So that was part of our discussion or should we? Yeah, yeah, we have, yeah. In three minutes, our discussion is over. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I echo Anne's admiration for you, Lauren. I just find you're just, the way that you like evoke like a feeling and like a, it's like you feel like you get punched in the gut, but at the same time you feel so much, um, yeah, like hope sometimes, sometimes not, right? And and when, but when it's, when you don't feel that hope, you feel like that fire, like to do something, right? It's like, I just, there's just, it's so rich. It's such rich work. So I just so appreciate you sharing with us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Also read all those poems. There's so many in there. I'm so sad we didn't get to them, <laughs> but there's so many. And um, I, 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 I'm fed by other poets and other work too. So, um, I'm so are those happy. poems you're talking about? Are they on the that work? They're in the they're in the doc. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I have another question. Absolutely. So, I'm curious. Um, have you ever doubt about to live with the life of a poem, um, as a poet, um, poet. Um, so what? So one, uh, what factors contribute to you to make the final decision to live a life with mm. a poem? Um, have you ever any doubts about this thing? Uh, or maybe after you get a get a success from the first success poem, then you decide to. Uh, to live the life with poem or what kind of other factors? I'm curious. Thank you. No, yeah. Th <laughs> thanks for that. Um, so, gosh, what part of it was. I don't even know. Um, I, I was a science student. I always say that I I'm from Trinidad. I was um, we have the British system, you know, do all the things narrow, 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 narrow. Um, do your owls if you are a Harry Potter fan. So um, my O levels were biochemistry, physics, math, additional math, infotech, <laughs> computer science. <laughs> right. Um, and then um, we had to do to our credit, we had to do English language, English literature, a foreign language. So I did French. Um, and so I so I had those and then like all my science subjects and when uh, time for A levels came, most people do like biochem math if you're going into medicine, physics math, add you know further math if you're doing engineering like you know so this is this is you just narrow your focus right. Um, and so that was maybe the first moment where I wasn't really quite that willing to release literature. So I did like, I started off with like physics, math, lit and French. And French was also like strategic because I wanted to go to this better other school and I needed to have a reason anyway. So I did French to get into that school. And then I was like, well, French and literature, obviously I'll do literature. And then like, oh, what science is left, you know? <laughs> so it was a really weird pairing at the time. And so with that pairing, I decided I was going to go into like radiologic science. And so that's what I came to the States ostensibly to study was radiologic science and nuclear medical technology and go home and get a job. And um, the way that program was structured was you do two years at the St. Francis. That's the college I went to. And then two years uh, finishing up at the hospital. And I think like, again, Fate. I wound up in an honors English class my first semester with a, the professor became my mentor. He died last month. Bless his heart. Bless your brother, Edward, um, who and I kind of just did that thing where you take the professor you love through. The, and he was just like, Lauren, what are you doing? Like, he said this thing. He said you were meant to be educated, not trained. And I didn't know what that meant, but I liked the sound of it. And then I also went to the orientation for radiology and I saw what my days would look like. And I was like, I can't do this. I, I do not wish to do this. So I became an English major and told my mom and I had no idea what an Englishist does. Like, what does an English major do? I, I didn't know. So I just kept going to school, you know? Um, and so I don't know. I feel like 
there's, I always tell people there are many doors in that question, right? I used to write calypsos for my sister when I was at home. She was a child performer and I was her, I wrote for her. And um, I kept writing even when I came to the States and I didn't have to write for somebody to do anything with it. So um, at some point I just decided that that was, that was the thing I couldn't, I, and I, it, it's hard where you're a good student. It's like I was flunking out of my anatomy class. Um, I, it just gave me no joy <laughs> and I decided to, to go for joy, I guess. And, um, and where I just really felt purpose and strong and true. And so, yeah, it, it worked out and, you know, my mom has stopped asking me if I didn't regret not going into medicine or doing radiology because, you know, I have a house and a car, so she's convinced that, okay, it worked out. Um, and I feel very blessed that that happened. <laughs> Amazing. That's awesome. Hooray. All right. Thank you so much. We do have to take a break because we have a full afternoon and evening left today. So, um, I appreciate you. Thank you so, you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone.